So my name is Jennifer Johnston. Um, I'm a freelance cartographer through Inspirit Cartographics, and I'm the coordinator for the British Cartographic Society's Restless Earth program. That's what I'm doing in England. Um, and I'm going to talk about color. So I'll just turn my camera off and share my screen. Uh, Shane, just shout at me if um, if anything goes wrong. Um, so here I am exploring um, how culture and technology influence the color trends in mapping. Um, I came to this idea because over the past couple of years, I've acquired um, a small collection of maps from the 60s and 70s, and I'm pretty blown away by their bright, bold and vibrant colors. Um, and I've wondered, why don't my maps have bright, bold, and vibrant colors? Is it because I got told off for trying out a mustard yellow landmass? Um, but speaking to other cartographers, I've realized I'm not alone, as they've reported a similar phenomenon of leading towards a more muted color palette. Um, so I decided to look around me. On the left is my little collection of maps from the 60s and 70s. And then on the right are the maps that I've found around me. Um, so I looked in the side door of uh, my share car and found a very sparsely colored road atlas, um, which isn't anything like the bright yellow Rand McNally from my childhood. Looking through my closet, I found a Barcelona city, city map from a couple of years ago, the Spanish love color. So surely that would be something colorful, but it's mostly gray. Um, and even a map showing locations relevant to legendary British musicians like Led Zeppelin um, is the palest of colors. Uh, of course, colorful maps do exist, but they seem to be either geared towards children or to be outliers from the mainstream. So what is this color trend about? I decided, I dec decided to start my exploration um, during the medieval and renaissance periods because this is when colors became highly symbolic and could be bought and sold. Uh, very few maps during this time were colored. Some were partially colored with color reserved for decorative surroundings or key features like coastlines or political borders. Many of these maps were colored long after their print date. In the 19th century, it was a popular hobby for society ladies to add color to old maps. If you go to an auction site um, looking at maps from this time period, you'll see that they talk about original or contemporary color, meaning the maps were colored close to the time of production, or modern color, meaning the map was colored a long time after the map was issued. Uh, and more often than not, you'll see that they're given the tag of modern color. Uh, and this was because uh, maps were all printed in black and white. So by either the wood cut method up here, or by the copper plating method down here. And in both cases, the map is either carved or etched into the surface, inked over and pressed onto the paper. Color was not part of the printing process. Color depended on how much the customer was willing to spend and how special the map was. If the map was given color, there would probably be only three or four colors and typically in earthy tones of green, reds, and yellows. Natural colorants were used at this time, um, and those made specifically from plants tended to be cheaper and more available than their brighter animal or mineral counterparts. Uh, Renaissance and medieval art also reflected this color palette. Bright colors were expensive and reserved for important characters. Ultramarine blue was more expensive than gold and reserved for figures like the Virgin Mary. Uh, in maps at this time, uh, it's pretty rare to see original color with 
potions painted blue. If there was any original blue, it tended to be used for the celestial surrounds of heaven. Um, ultramarine, meaning beyond the sea, um, was so precious because it was made from lapis lazuli, which is mined in Afghanistan, and was brought over to, um, I guess, the English colonies by Italian merchants. So earthier hues like pink made from matter wood or yellow uh, from dandelions or onion skins was much cheaper and easier to come by. A rich yellow like saffron would be expensive and difficult to get as it came from India. Purple would take 10,000 murex shellfish to create one gram of pigment. Um, but to have maps in this time um, gave you the reputation of being sophisticated, and maps were given the same value as fine art. Color showed wealth and became increasingly uh, in demand um, as people wanted to show they were both wealthy and sophisticated. Um, so as colors became uh, in greater demand, they also became more commercial. Um, and colors start creeping more and more into the map. In 1704, the first synthetic pigment was produced, Prussian blue, a bright color that was affordable. Um, it, by 1826, there were lots of synthetic colors on the market, um, being not only cheaper but less variable in quality. In 1760, caked um, watercolors were created, and in 1860, oil paint became packaged in tubes, uh, which was much easier than carrying around paint in a pig's bladder. In 1796, the lithograph was invented, and now color could be part of the printing process instead of an afterthought. By the end of the 19th century, almost any color could be purchased in some synthetic form for a relatively cheap price. Um, a good example of this is Impressionist art. Artists like Van Gogh and Gauguin were not rich men, but they didn't hold back on color. And then in 1934, colors were created. And according to Crayola, new colors are still being invented to this day. So this explains how we got from the color palette of the 1700s to the color palette of the 1920s. But in the 60s and 70s, we have a color explosion. Pop artists were using bright, bold, solid colors. The world of music was even more colorful. Interior design was all about those solid, bold colors. And um, maps, too, had bright, bold, vibrant colors. It has gone beyond just having the colors available. So what was happening at this time? Woodstock happened. Hippie culture erupted. We had the Civil Rights Act and Martha Luther King's powerful spe speech, I Have a Dream. Women's liberation, demanding equality, many skirts, uh, started coming into fashion to reflect those emboldened women. Space exploration was making leaps and bounds. Um, we had trips to Mars and the first man on the moon. Um, experimentation with psychedelics was trending. People were pushing back against the government, refusing war. This was a society as bold as their colors, where anything was possible. So what changed? Today's color palette is light and muted. Lifestyle blogs, fashion magazines, and interior designs use this palette. Apple, who at the start of the millennium were making those bright colored desktops, are now making their latest product, AirPods, in one of these four muted colors. Looking on Amazon, even Maps are using this color scheme. And I'm using this color scheme. Um, so why? Is it a result of making and viewing maps on screen? Is it a functional thing? Is it a reflection of a muted society? 
Um, is it a result of too much blue light? Are we all chilled out from that yoga craze? Um, what, what happened? So I asked around um, a variety of different professions. A healthcare worker sees it as functional. The muted colors allow for information to be highlighted. Um, an HR professional and an engineer think it's related to, to technology, viewing things on screen and accommodating those with visual impairments. My coffee dealer thinks maps are computer generated, causing a lack of individuality and less color options is simpler. A teacher, a journalist, and an artist think it reflects corporations dictating the trends, trying to appeal to a broad as market as possible in avoiding risk. A designer sees it as a political or society response. Bold colors convey power and the Western world is declining in military and commercial power as countries like Russia, China, and India get stronger. What do maps in these countries look like? Was it impacted by the financial crash of 2008? Paler colors indicating a lack of confidence and feeling of uncertainty. Um, but what I'm really interested in hearing, though, is what people in the mapping industry think. So thanks very much. All right, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, I remember too, maybe we had the same textbooks growing up, those old Rand McNally with the green cover, bright, bold atlases of Canada and the world. Um, and yeah, you're right, we don't see those, um, those types of um, color palettes used anymore. Uh, except I was thinking, for example, um, new cartographers, and I'm sure all the academics and professors out there who teach classes in GIS and cartography would know that a lot of new cartographers will experiment and play um, with color. And I've personally found that those types of maps can be hard to read. But I was wondering, right off the bat, you'd mentioned um, that, you're, that you're, in your experience, you've been told not to use those colors. So did you have a specific type of training? Um, and what do you think about that? Um, I was never told to use more muted colors. But um, I guess my clients pushed back. They didn't, like, for example, when I tried out, tried to make, I think it was San Francisco mustard yellow. Um, they thought it was garish and, you know, could I please use 5% gray? Um, and for the most part, I've, I've just found people are going for that, you know, minimalist look. Um, and my clients, anyways, haven't liked bright colors. And they've pushed towards a softer palette. Hmm. Were there any other comments out there in uh, conference land? Well, thanks. Oh, here we go. Mea culpa from Roger Wheat, uh, a child of the 60s, and I teach my students to use muted colors. I'm going back to the future. Roberta Mason asks the age of your clients. Um, I would say they are typically older than me. Um, so I'm, I'm 37, so I guess they would be in their 40s to 60s. Julie Wittmer or Whitmer says, very interesting talk. Now I want to try bolder colors in my own maps for a change. Mm. Chris Brackley from As the Crow Flies, Cartography. A really interesting walk through the history of color, Jen. I too have desaturated year after year. It does make type easier to read though. Do you see this as a driver for change? Um, having type easier to read, perhaps, yeah. 
Perhaps it is as um, a healthcare worker I spoke to, she thought it was a functional thing so that you could highlight only the important information. Hmm. Uh, Byron says, map I helped design, which had biggest reaction, used pink for water. Wow. What about color conventions? Yeah, I don't know. I'd love to see a pink colored ocean. And Frank Tuff out of Alberta, I believe. I wonder if you have looked at any studies of perception and comprehension. No, I haven't. Um, I've been curious about... Um, the uh, accessibility thing. So I, I do know um, a company that makes maps specifically for the color impaired, and they mm -hmm. use a full range of color. Um, so, but no, I don't, I don't really know about any studies regarding perception and comprehension, but send them my mm -hmm. way if you have any in mind. Rings similar to when I was working in land surveying and you're out in the bush and everything's green and brown and gray uh, and the flagging tape that works the best isn't the blues and the yellows, it's the pinks and the reds. Mm. Uh, you need to catch our eye. Maybe it uh, has to do with um, our attention to ripe berries or something. Mm. Pam McQuarrie uh, says, I wonder if printer ink was an influence on wanting to desaturate colors. Yeah, that could be. Um... Yeah, I'm just looking at um, gig posters, though, as I go around town, are all printed in neon. Um, however, those are, I'm sure, are to attract passing cars, so they've got to. Um, but perhaps it is cheaper to print in desaturated colors. I'm not sure. Hmm. And Roberta Mason comment again, color can have significantly different meanings across cultures. And I know some from some linguistic evidence, personally, um, that many different languages uh, only have a few different words for colors. Uh, and usually if you're going to have two words, it's black and white. If you've got a third, it's almost always red. And if you have a fourth, it's probably a blue or a green. Uh, else says, great topic. I've thought a lot about which color is most appropriate for maps these days. I also noticed the preference for muted colors to increase overall legibility of a map and to not be too overwhelming. And Melissa Castron says, I'm interested in the use of bright light uh, in maps, like electricity. Do you consider this to be part of the trends in color? Um, I'm not sure about uh, what you mean by bright light. Is that we're viewing in an, I guess when you're viewing on screen, you're getting the RGB light versus on print would be CMYK, so additive versus subtractive. Or um, bright light. Um, or are we viewing things under our bright light bulbs? No, I'm not sure, Melissa. Sorry, I don't quite know what you're talking about. Melissa, if you wanted to clarify, or we have a bit of a delay in our presentation. So she says more in the sense of digital oh. maps. Uh, like an animation. Um, yeah, well, I haven't really seen too many of those, really. I guess for me, mostly I work in publishing. So online publishing or print publishing. Um, but yeah, that that, I imagine, would be fantastic looking. Well, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If anyone else um, had something, a comment even. Jen, you were asking, um, you know, other people's, other cartographers' thoughts for why, why the muted, uh, rather than this distaste for the mustard yellows of the world. Mm. And looking, um, looking at my collection, I don't, well, granted, I, I don't have any slight problems, but when I look at maps from the 60s and 70s, I don't find them difficult to read, but perhaps that's because 
my vision. I don't need glasses. I don't have um, uh, color blindness. Mm. Well, thank you so much. And um, I'm looking forward to chatting with you more about color. It's certainly a topic I'm really interested in.